Uh, what's, when's that? Hello. Oh, good morning. Good. All right. Good. Hey, it's the last week of, week, week of October, which means Christmas is in like a month and a half, so. Yippee! All right. Tell you what, we're going to do something a little different this morning. We're going to stand on the first song, all right? All right. Love Lifted Me is our first song this morning, so. <laughs> it if you want to do <laughs> rest a little bit. Next song is Rescue the Perishing.
Praise the Lord. Welcome to the very last day of the month of October. We're thankful for uh, uh, the good month the Lord has given us here at Harbor Baptist Church. And I'll let you know, Pastor is actually, he and his wife have made the landing. They are back in town. But this morning, they are actually in St. Augustine, visiting a, a friend's church this morning. And so uh, they are looking to be with us, though, tonight for our fifth Sunday sing. So I want to encourage you to come back tonight. Not only to obviously greet them, but to come and sing and, and to have a good time of fellowship tonight as we will be uh, uh, talking a little bit more about that a little bit later, all right? And so, again, let me ask you to stand. If you're able, we're going to say our, for the last time, our memory verse for the month of October there. And we certainly want to uh, give a welcome to each of you today. And uh, so we have some guests with us, returning guests as well. And so we thank you for coming. And... I have uh, something for you in the back. If you are a visitor today, we certainly welcome you. I appreciate you coming. But see me at the back. I've got a gift to give you. And uh, just a quick thank you for uh, being in our services today. So we certainly want to um, uh, praise the Lord for that. All right? Well, let's do our verse. Here we go. It's First Chronicles 16.11. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. First Chronicles 16, 11. All right, that's good. I appreciate that very, very much. Let's do pray, and then we'll let you wave and have a seat when we're done. All right, Father, thank you so much for uh, this good day you've given us. Bless, please, our service as we do worship you. Father, we recognize who we are, so small, so sinful. God, yet you're so big, so wonderful, and sinless. Lord, may we worship thee today. Help us to sing from our heart. Help us to give with joy. Father, help us to enjoy our fellowship one with another today. But most of all, may you speak to us as we meet together today. Lord, we seek you today. We ask God that you would speak in a, in a very dear and precious way to our hearts. Lord, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, what a day that would be to see them trust Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, out of simple faith and trust. God, please uh, be with us, we pray. Again, we're grateful for those that have gathered together today in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, give away a roundabout. And we're going to sing our next song, and you may be seated. Last song this morning is Oh, How I Love Jesus. <laughs>
Yes, amen. Thank you, Brother Jim. Appreciate that. I don't mind Burl Ives singing here every now and again. <laughs> That's a blessing. I appreciate that. I appreciate all of our musicians and singers and those that take the time and practice and sing, and, and uh, we're thrilled about that, I know. And um, our, God has blessed our church. I'm thankful. And uh, uh, just listening to other, other preachers around the country, friends of ours, they just say, my goodness, I wish we had one piano player. And we've got a number, so we thank the Lord for that, certainly. Well, if you would, please uh, take your Bible there and turn to Mark chapter number 5. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 5 will continue in our study and examination of the encounters with Christ, close encounters with Christ. And we're here at the cemetery today. Now, I have to confess, I did not think of this as Halloween Sunday when I was using this message title. <laughs> None of you are going to believe me, I know, but it's the honest truth, and it dawned on me just as I was typing this for, the, for, the, for you, <clears throat> I saw cemetery, and I knew that, and I thought, oh, this is Halloween Sunday. <laughs> so, whether you believe me or not, that's between you and God, but I honestly did not think of that. <clears throat> but it is what it is, all right? Uh, how many like cemeteries? Look at all those hands going up. <laughs> I actually, Jordan here has just been back from a Baptist history tour, and he toured a bunch of cemeteries as well, and, and such, and it was those old-time ones where you can see the dates you can barely read, and they have the long, tall uh, edifice there. And, and I remember long ago, I have to digress just a little bit here, but do find Mark chapter number five, all right? Uh, I was a teenager back in 1984, 80, eh, I think it was 84, 
And I was traveling with uh, some folks with evangelist Larry Clayton, who you'll see here in December. He'll be here with us. And uh, again, for the winter time. But uh, I was traveling with him as a young lad. He was about 50 at the time. And <clears throat> actually, he was younger than I am right now when I was traveling with him. That was just hard for me to think about. But we were in a town of Coloss, Coloss, New York, not far from Syracuse. Anybody know where that place is? Oh, good. Then I'll tell it to you anyway. Uh, but anyway, there was a little old Baptist church there, the big kind that had the white, white walls and the steeple that were there and the stained glass kind of a window. You would think of it as maybe a Lutheran church, I, I guess, but it was actually a Baptist. It hadn't historically been a Baptist church, but it was at the time, and we were there in a meeting. And our, our RVs, we had our, our, our travel trailers, and Brother Clayton had his, and I had mine and our team. And so we were parked there in the back of the church parking lot. Right next to the parking lot was what? A good old cemetery with the iron rod fences all around. And those, those long, tall things with crosses and angels and all that kind of stuff there. And, yeah, creepy. But I said to my buddy, I said, hey, let's go sleep in the cemetery tonight. <laughs> it's got a full moon going. Let's go do it. And Brother Clayton said, you'll never last. I said, oh, yeah? We're 16 years old. We are strong. We are, you know, no one's going to bother us. We got out there with our sleeping bags, rolled it out between a couple of those big old statue things, you know, laid there, heard the birds, the owls, chains. You know, our minds is just going. The next morning, Brother Clayton says, so, how was your night in the cemetery? We said, oh, it was good. We were just fine for the first half hour, and we went back in the motorhome. <laughs> I don't know. We just both, you figured, you figured, you know, tough guys, you know, we're out there 16 years old, no one can take us. But man, laying in that cemetery at night did us in. We weren't going to go there. Well, I can only imagine, because of what happened then, I'm thinking of our story here today. As we deal with this man, this, this man who was possessed by demons, multiple demons, had his time there in the cemetery, which was really his home for this while. And so as we get into this story, um, it's a little bit different in that our, our, uh, our encounters have historically been with one person. Yet this is still this one person, but there's five different views to this, this lesson here today. And you have the notes before you. So we're going to examine this particular uh, encounter from the eyes of five different uh, peoples, I guess. And so if you will join me there in, uh, in Mark chapter number 5 and verse number 1. It says, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of of the Gadarenes. Now they're coming across the Sea of Galilee. And across this sea, I don't know exactly at what point there were, how long it was, but um, they were making their way to the Gadarene side, which would be the uh, area of what they'd call Decapolis, which was a district. Deca, meaning ten. These were Gentile Roman cities that were stationed along that seashore. And so, again, there was ten of those particulars, and one was the Gadara, whatever. And so the Gadarenes is where he was making his way, Jesus and his disciples. <clears throat> now, if you remember, in the previous chapter, this here is where Jesus, having had done a, a work on the seashore on the other side, he tells his, his uh, disciples, let's get in a boat, and we're going to go to the other side. And so if you remember the story, he with his disciples make their way across. It's about even time, the Bible says. If you go back there in Mark chapter 4, the latter verse is there. It says about even was come. And so I would take that to mean that the evening was coming. Don't know what kind, time of year. I don't know that it's dark. I don't believe it was dark. But nonetheless, it was enough time where they felt they needed to get across the sea and it's probably better to do it during daylight hours than it would be at total night. So they were making their way across. Jesus then does what? He goes and retires to the back of the boat, puts his head on a pillow, and he is dreaming and loving his heavenly father and thinking, okay, any time now they're going to get scared because he's going to bring up a storm. He's about to teach his disciples yet another lesson on fear and faith. 
And so there he is asleep. We know the story. The storm comes abruptly. And the winds make their way. And, uh, and the, uh, the howling sounds you could imagine. The lightning I can picture. And the thunder is making a tumultuous time. And there they are, fearful that they're going to die. And what do they say? Master, awake, they say. Carest thou not that we perish? Can you imagine what kind of verbiage they're using to Jesus there? And so he wakes up and he says, why are you so fearful? Why are you have so, you know, so little faith? And he looks, up to, to, uh, looks over the sea. And I can picture him putting his hand out there and saying, peace be still. With that thundering voice of Jesus, the God of the sea, the master of the sea. As he speaks, and all of a sudden, the clouds, you can imagine, are gone, vanished. The waves move down to glass. The sea is now steady, heading towards the Gadarenes. And of course, Jesus ends that verse there. In verse number 41, the previous chapter, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Goes into the next chapter where we pick up. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Now again, as we just pause, the Gadarenes on that side, on that coast, was very uh, hilly, mountainous on that side. It, was, it, would, it would come right up against the Sea of Galilee. And so you could picture with me the, the hillside, very tall. And amongst those hills would be what they would have a, a, a tombs. It would be hewn out rocks, areas that were naturally done. And then, of course, maybe by hand as they would make their way to be able to have a place for the dead. It was outside of the city limits. Almost all of those particulars back then had, did not have their burial grounds within the city, but they had them out and about away from the city, separating life and death. And so here on that hillside, can you picture with me, up, up tall would be these crevices of places where the tombs would be, and uh, wayfarers, they say, would make their way through, and they would find these places, a place of hiding from the weather and such. They would they'd crawl into those tomb areas and say, scoot over, you know, whatever, and they're going to be there for the night. And so here was this man, though, as we'll read about him, uh, is going to be there as his new temporary home. Verse number two, though, it says, And when he was come out of the ship, this is Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. I'm going to pause right there. Our first point here is looking and examining this encounter at the cemetery through the eyes of the desperate. So that's your point number one. Through the eyes of the desperate, this would be this particular man. It says, and no man could bind him, verse 3, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and, chain, and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Notice this. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. That's the ending of verse number 6. We will not move to the next point, but it is going to change dramatically in that particular view. But here in this, through the eyes of the desperate, we see this man. <clears throat> it doesn't give a, a picture as whether he's a Jewish man or whether he's a Gentile. What's good about that is we can, re, we can put ourselves into that. It wasn't something that he had to have a particular, uh, he had to have a particular pedigree for Jesus to come to him. It was just simply a man. On the other side as well, these demons, these devils, it didn't matter to them either who they would indwell. They chose a man such as this. I don't know uh, as to, to, to possibly say that he maybe have ro has, had rolled out the carpet, red carpet, by his own heart and his own mind, uh, in some ways uh, entertaining sins that would be not so good. Maybe he, had, in his life, had already been, uh, in, in a way, um, just in a sinful state. We see he's not with his family anymore. Uh, he's maybe at some point in his life he had gotten so used to sin and sinning that it was like a, a beacon for the devil say, hey, dwell within me, dwell within me. 
Again, we don't know all that was there. But as it is said to be very likely that the man had a sin problem. And we all know that if we start playing with the wrong kind of game, now not us Christians, please, and I'm not going to talk about the, 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 the truth that would be when we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is true. When we are saved, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We cannot be indwelled by an evil spirit. That's an impossibility. We have the Holy Spirit. It cannot have any room with a devil. We can be oppressed, but not possessed. Can I say it that way? And so with that being said, this man was lost. He was possessed. And so one of the ways, even in modern days, when we see a person that are possessed, you know what the, the scriptural answer is? Salvation. So when the Holy Spirit comes to indwell into that person through his desire, just like this young man came at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, he desired to be exercised from the devils within him. He came and fell at his feet. There Jesus would then do his, ma not magic, but he'd do his work. So we here that are saved, we cannot be possessed, overcome and taken by the devils. Only a lost person can have that happen. And so this man being lost, here he was a man with no name. It didn't matter to the devils. All right, but also being no name, it didn't matter to Jesus. He didn't have to be a Jew, didn't have to be a Gentile. He just needed to be a soul that was desperate. And Jesus came, all right? And so here we see it through the eyes of this desperate man. If you just picture with me the story, though. As we can see his desperateness, as he says, he saw him afar. And now he comes down and meets him, according to the very, you know, those first and second verses. He came and meet him, the Bible says, immediately when the boat came to shore. Okay, you take that with the verse number six, where he says that he saw him afar off. I can't help but my mind thinks this way. So you're going to have to jump on my brain, all right? This is how it goes. <clears throat> can you imagine him cutting himself? and screaming and yelling in the mountainside like he normally did. And he comes and rests upon a, a rock that would be there, looking over the Sea of Galilee, where the tombs would be at that cemetery, just crying. And all of a sudden, he looks out at the sea, and he sees clouds coming over. He sees the lightning flashing, and the noise, and the tumultuous time at the sea, and he's staring, because he can see just a ship and some other little ships making their way towards him. And all of a sudden, I mean, after it had been going on for a while, all of a sudden, it's gone. Maybe even he heard a thunderous voice. My imagination's catching up to me. I totally know that. But nonetheless, bear with me. Here is that, that scene that he's looking over from the cemetery. And he sees this great power, this tremendous power in the skies that has all of a sudden vanished and the sea has turned to glass. And this little boat and other boats are making their way to the shore. That made him think, there is something about that boat. There's something about somebody on that boat. And if he could think of the desperateness of that man, if he can calm the peaceful skies, I wonder if he could calm my heart. And so he makes his way down to meet this boat coming to shore. He gets down there in verse number six. Can you imagine there? And as always, night and day, he was in the mountains, verse five, and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran down the hillside, ran to the beach, and as the boat would come, he met him there, and he bowed down and worshiped him. All of a sudden, it changes, though. There's the eye of the desperate as he falls on his knees in front of Jesus. And then it's as if there was a light switch. Verse number seven happens. Look with me there. Now this is through the eyes of the demonic. Through the eyes of the demonic. It says, and, and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? Thou son of the most high God, I adjure thee by God. That means, adjure means I, I, I beg you to promise, lay an oath, please promise me. That, the scripture says, um, by God, that thou torment me not. What was it to torment him? He realized those demons that will be within him, they, they took their strength, their abilities within, and as they encapsulated themselves within a human or within a being, a way that they can move about and rather not being free into the abyss 
or free into the, into the world alone. They needed to, and they did their best work and felt most comfortable in dwelling a desperate soul. And so when they said, don't torment us, have you come to torment me? That means to exercise or bring them out of that being which gave them their power, or not their power, but their abilities to, uh, to use that, that body. They didn't want to be adrift. <clears throat> Those, that's what was going on when they said that. And I noticed as well that they knew full well who Jesus was. And it's kind of like a split personality. I kind of wonder whenever that legion, as we see, is the name given, this group of demons within him, as they're up on that hillside, you have that two-sided man that was torn asunder. You had a man desperately pleading to have peace in his life, to go home with his family, to be freed of this horrible chain that he has. And yet inside him dwells those spirits, and they're also watching Jesus coming across the sea. They're also watching the clearness of the sky and the glassiness of the water. And they full well knew that was Jesus. So between the two of them, they end up making their way down because the will of the man in desperacy brings that body down to the seashore. But immediately, in the presence of Jesus, the demon speaks up and says, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? He knew who he was. So that's a testimony through the devil's eyes who he was now to the desperate man. This is Jesus. This is the son of the living God. This is he who, who caused that peace to be, be still there. And now, now maybe he can cause the peace in my own heart. As we see going through this eye of the demonic, it goes on a little bit in verse number nine. It says, and he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered saying, my name is Legion for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there were nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. Now I have to digress just a moment. How many here have a dramatic reading of their Bible? You have a, a way you can listen to it. Rather than Alexander Scorby reading the Bible in the British brogue. That's all good, I have that. But we as well, our kids have been raised with this, having the dramatic Bible, which means there's different voices. When a lady's speaking, it's a lady's voice. When a ma does anyone have any one of those? You recognize? Yeah, no, our, field do, our, our family does. Well, it's so good because when it comes to this, guys, I can't help it. My, it goes on and says... Uh, uh, what is thy name? And then you'll hear in the text of the, the audio, it'll say, My name is Legion, for we are many. Isn't that impressive? <laughs> but when I'm listening to it, I'm just going, Oh, man, that's kind of scary. My name is... Then you hear the thundering voice of God, and then you hear it in a, a different voice. It, it's just, it's entertaining, it's exciting. It kind of puts you there as you're reading through the Bible. That's just awesome. And that's kind of why I am what I am, I guess. I don't know. But that's... That I, I, I blame it all on those dramatic Bible, all right, that I do. Nonetheless, they even said, Send us into the swine that, me, that we may enter in them. Well... Jesus gives them the word, lets them go. In verse number four, 13, and forthwith Jesus gave them leave. Don't you love the power that Jesus has over the, the evil spirits? They were recognizing him as all-powerful, recognizing him as the Son of God, and were totally submissive to him just by the power of his word to send them away out of that man and into these pigs that were along the seashore there. Notice, though, uh, it says in, in, in uh, latter, latter part of verse 13, And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. Remember our picture of that hillside? And there would be those tombs. Well, on the top would be that grassy, <laughs> grassy knoll up there, all right? And there would be that area where the, the, the uh, swine uh, herdsmen would be there. The pig farmers uh, would be up there. And, and uh, all of a sudden, can you imagine being one of those guys? You know, talking, suey, suey. All of a sudden, this great noise and this whoosh. And all of a sudden, the pigs go nuts. 
and they just start squealing, and all as if they were just heading straight for the cliff, and all 2,000 of them head totally out of control, and the, you know, the, the, the herdsmen are going, what is going on? Hey, get back here, get back here. And all of a sudden, just one after another, blump, 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 deviled ham is what I'm thinking. <laughs> all right, I know, ha uh ha. -huh. So there they are, floating in the water, floating in the abyss, down they go. The herdsmen are thinking, what in the world? What are we going to tell the, our owners? What are we going to say? But they recognized that there was a lot of coincidences going on here. You know, they knew full well who this, I call him Crazy Carl. So Carl, I'm not, no offense, all right? But this was Crazy Carl running all over the hillside, screaming and crying and cutting himself. He was well known by the city. And those men that were up there and, and having the herds of, of, the, of the, the swine, they knew it. And all of a sudden, they would know that there was a conference, a meeting going down there at the seashore. And just as that meeting had happened, all of a sudden, now their pigs are making this mess and flying off over the hill. And they were putting one and one, making two. Well, let's see what's going on here. So here that was that... that this examination here for us is through the eyes of the desperate man, now the, the demonic man. But now let's look at, the, in verse 14, let's look at that through the eyes of the, of the delegation, of the delegation, the delegates of people that were uh, gathered together. Look in verse 14. This says, and they, they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that was done. Oh, who came back? People that were curious, I'm sure the owners of the, of the swines were going to come out there and see what was going on, and others that would follow. And notice verse 15. They didn't come to the edge where, like the scene of the crime, where they went off over the hill. Where did they go? Amazingly, they went straight to Jesus because they knew he was the culprit. They knew something had to do with that man and that crazy Carl. And so they made there in verse 15, and they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil. They knew who he was. And there he was, the man who was possessed with the devil and that had the legion, uh, Mark is saying, he was though sitting and clothed and in his right mind. The Bible says, and they were afraid. What do you think they were afraid of? Well, they're afraid of, obviously, the power of the change that had happened. That was a mystery to them. They knew Crazy Carl. And now he's changed in a dramatic way. But I think it hit the, the pockets more so of those, those, sh those uh, shepherds or the, the pig farmers as well as the owners. Because that was 2,000 pigs that went over the side. That was a lot of money. And they were fearful that if this man had this kind of power over this guy to make that kind of a change, what could he do to the rest of us around here? Are we going to lose all our pigs? Are, are we going to, is all these things going to start changing because of this man? They said, I don't want any to do anything to do with him. It goes in verse 16, and they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And so those sheep herders told the, the city folk, as they gathered there around Jesus, they told them the story. So you know those pig farmers up on the hillside knew full well what had just happened when all that devils left the man, Crazy Carl, as it entered into all the swine and as they took off over the hill, possessed with those devils. They knew the story. They knew it happened because of him. And now this is given to these folks. They're upset, and they realize they're going to start losing money. This is not going to be a good thing. Remember, that same thing happened in Ephesus when Paul came, and the goddess Diane, and the people that were making all kinds of money off, of, off, the, off the images and the selling of, of the things there in Ephesus. And when the world was getting turned upside down with Paul and his cohorts, they feared the loss of a whole lot of money because of the gospel making its effect. Well, yeah, the gospel does make its effect on the economy and on our world, and on us particularly and individually. Well, there at verse number uh, six, uh, 17, though, it says, And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. They didn't want this man here. 
this was a loss of money. And you know what it also lets us see, see? through the eyes of these, these, this delegation, they cared more for the sheep than they cared for the man who was delivered. It didn't matter to them. But Jesus looked at it in a whole opposite direction because that's what we're going to go, th- you know, we'll be looking at here in just a minute. He desired truly the best for the man rather than the, the, the swine that would be. Well, that's through the eyes of the delegation. Look with me in verse number 18. We'll look through the eyes of the delivered. Same man as the desperate, but now he's a changed man. All right? He's all changed. We saw it written there in verse 15, though, uh, before we get to 18. It says, the scripture says, he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. He was totally clothed, and he was in his right mind. He had that peaceful mind, very much like the peaceful sea that he saw just moments before. He uh, uh, was there in verse number 18, though. And when he was come into the ship, this is, of course, remember verse 17, they asked him to leave. Well, he gets back into the ship there in verse number 18. And the latter part of that, the middle part of that, verse 18, it says, And he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him, begged him, that he might be with him. What did he want to do? Through the eyes of the man who's now delivered, he wanted to be with Jesus. He didn't want to necessarily go home right away. The most important thing ever happened to him right now. And that the deliverer, Jesus, delivered him from all of this sorrow and all of this turmoil of his heart. This was some powerful being, this son of God. He recognized him as, and he wanted to be with him. Reminds me of uh, the story of uh, Larry Clayton when he was in uh, Haiti. And uh, back there, you'd have to go and take soap and they, they bring with them. And they'd go down to the river and they'd find a place where they could not be seen. He said it was really tough because there's so many eyes everywhere down there. And, uh, and to see a white guy or white people amongst the blacks in the river soaping themselves up and dunking themselves in the water, getting clean, it was a, a sight to be seen, certainly. But he said there was these little boys, these little Haitian boys, that followed him into the water. And they were just as dirty as could be, just, just filthy. So Brother Clayton grabs his bar of soap, and he starts scrubbing their little head, scrubbing their little faces, scrubbing their body up. Got them all clean, dumped them in the water, and washed all the soap off. Set them up on a rock when they were all done. And he says, I can't help but the rest of the days that I was with there, with, he says, there was one little Haitian boy on my left hip and another little Haitian boy on my right hip. Everywhere he went were those two little smiling boys because they were all clean and they felt all good, all because of the effort done by this big white man. If you know Brother Clayton, then you'll see why that is. But nonetheless, he, uh, and hope he doesn't watch this video, but <laughs> nonetheless, because of the soap and the clean feeling, they just wanted to be around Brother Clayton. Isn't that just how God is and how we ought to be when we, knew who, we know who cleans us up? We know who sets us free from our sorrow and our pain. Don't you just want to be with him? That's just how this man was, this delivered man now. He wanted to be with Jesus. But Jesus says, no, although you're clothed and all things are right now, he says, I want you to go home there. Now through the eyes there of the, the delivered, now we're going to go through the eyes of the divine. This is Jesus' point of view, certainly. But I'll go ahead and read there in uh, verse number 19. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends. If you go to Luke, you'll see it went to go home to family. Go home to friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. It goes on and says, And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. And so we see that delivered man did go home. He did go and publish, tell, preach, tell everybody what Jesus had done for him. So Jesus, though, tells him to go through the eyes of the divine, and he does such. As we think about this, though, I was kind of moving back to our water scene after Jesus is making his way across the water. Jesus had a a plan in his mind from the very beginning because he's God. He knows all things. He plans all things. And we can only do things, we're just, we can't, we're not even good at multitasking, at least not me. I can do one thing, and that's one thing at a a time, pretty much. Um, But 
Jesus can do all things at the same time. And so through the eyes of, of the divine, you know, his, he was focused on his disciples in the ship. And he was focusing on their fears and trying to build their faith and seeing the power that Jesus had. But don't you think that while he was stilling the calm, that his eyes didn't cast up on the hillside there to that man that was looking down at him? and seeing, I'm going to go see him. In the midst of his teaching, he's in reach of a desperate soul. If you see how the verses go, Jesus came to the shore. He had the encounter at the cemetery. And at verse number uh, eight, 17, where they, depart, they asked him to depart, we see that in verse 18, he did get in the boat to leave. You know what that tells me? That Jesus left that evening to take his his disciples on a boat ride, but for the sole purpose of reaching a desperate man and, and to take the, the evils away from him so that he might get back in the boat that very same time and go back across the sea. That's through the eyes of the divine. It didn't matter how far he needed to go, to what expense he would, would take his disciples through, and even a teaching lesson that would be there, certainly, but also to the reach this one particular soul. Jesus saw him afar off just like this desperate man saw Jesus afar off. Ladies and gentlemen, as we just close out our thoughts here this morning, I'd like to just point out here in our notes, Jesus is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of our worship. He is the master of the sea. He's the calmer of the sea. He's the master of all spirits. He's the savior of our souls. Don't you know Jesus is worthy? He's all powerful and he is worthy of our worship. We gather here today on a Sunday morning. Oh, we can enjoy ourselves. We can laugh a little bit, cry a little bit. We can, we can be involved in the message here. We can enjoy shaking hands, fist bumping, whatever we do here together and sing. And we can give as unto the Lord. All of these things is truly a worship unto the Lord because it's our hearts being at one with the heart of God as he speaks with us, as he meets with us, we're grateful for that time together. And so he is worthy. No one is worthy like Jesus is worthy of our heartfelt worship. The psalmist said it this way in 5, verse number 7, Psalm 5, 7, But as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Psalm 138, verse 2, this was my alma mater, uh, my, my college I went to in Maslin, Ohio. This was their, their uh, verse, and uh, I remember it as it was 30-some years ago. I will worship toward thy holy temple. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. That is what we do when we come to church. We magnify his word above all his name. Oh, we'll sing wonderful songs. We'll have a, a great time in the name of the Lord as we, we, uh, we greet each other. And we'll give in the name of the Lord our offerings unto the Lord. But as we lift up the word of God, that is what we worship. That is, what we, that, that is how we worship. That is what we give honor more than any other thing is his word. And so when it's time for the preaching, when it's time for the word, it is the time to be serious and saying, yes, Lord, speak to me. Lord, please help me. Maybe we come to church in a desperate way. We can leave delivered. Thank God that we have uh, and that Jesus is truly worthy of our worship. Number two, Jesus has the power. Jesus has the power over the evil one. Oh, we saw that in our text. There was not a, a difficult thing for God. It wasn't a difficult thing for Jesus at all. With his very word. Well, he spoke the world into existence. Don't you think in one word he can calm the seas? And in one or a few words just say, go. And the devils would leave. And basically bowing, saying yes. And they're leaving in the presence of the Almighty. They went and joined themselves to a bunch of hogs. And made their way over the sea. Wow, Jesus has the power over the, over the evil one. In Mark chapter 1, verse 27, you can go back, you don't have to right now, but you can see Jesus also dealt with unclean spirits there. And in so doing there, in verse number 27, it says, And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. 
They were astonished at the power over the evil spirits. Thank God for the power that he has. He has that power over us when we get ourselves enslaved in our sins. When we're chained to our habits, when we are, are, are fettered in a way that we cannot move of ourselves, and it seems like we're in, in a way that, that, that we're hopelessly lost. And if we don't know Jesus as our, as our Savior, we can if we come to him in desperacy. We come and fall at his feet and beg his salvation. He will. He will give it to us. Uh, uh, he, uh, he is not going to turn aside anyone that comes unto him. Thank God for that. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The same God who delivered the, that desperate man, if you know Jesus as your Savior today, He delivered you and from the power of those wicked, horrible sins. But even on a daily walk, this is for us as well, even every day as we live and breathe and serve, He has the power over the evil one in our daily lives. We're not bound to sin like we were. More or less, we have a, a wanter. <laughs> we have our own heart, and we decide oftentimes we're not enslaved anymore. So we have to really be careful. When we sin, we sin co oftentimes because we want to, because we did, because we can. We have to be real careful. And, but Jesus has the power over that just as much. Have, get us through habits that we're dealing with. You say, well, when I get saved, all those habits are gone, are they? I've known people that I've never smoked, but I've heard people that said, you know, Brother Mike, that was the hardest thing for me to ever get rid of. The hardest thing that, that, that captivated my, my, my senses and my, and my feelings and, and, my, and my inner desire for that, that was a chemical desire. I could not get rid of it outside of the power of God and, and help, of course, well, if there's any kind of a thing, you know, the, the patch, you name it, whatever it could be that can help you, that's all there, that's all good. But ultimately, Jesus has the power and can deliver you from even those things beyond salvation, but in our daily, daily walk. We thank God for his power over the, the evil one. Number three, Jesus can change even the vilest sinner. I don't think we can rate ourselves and we ought not rate ourselves as to what kind of a sinner we are. Do you realize that because you were born into this world with a sinful seed, you are already d destined for a devil's hell. And you may never sin, you may never willfully sin. And in our minds, we, you know, we've done all, remember, that, remember the, rich, run, the uh, rich ruler from last week? Why he kept all those things from his youth up? Well, yeah, that's not what sent him to hell. It's because of his seed of Adam that's in him. That seed of sin that's already there. You're born lost. You're born on your way to, heaven, uh, on your way to hell. And so we need to have an in, a, a, a intersection of grace and God and the Holy Spirit and the Word to find us to be saved. So, uh, uh, but Jesus can change the vilest sinner. We know the verse there, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ. That's any man. What kind of sinner? A good sinner or a bad sinner? A not so bad sinner? We have levels, don't we? We have these sin levels. We say, oh, he's a murderer, or he's a whatever, you name it, down to gossiping, or he just offended me, whatever the case may be. We all put them on levels, but God doesn't put them on levels because what we perceive as the most vile, even uh, uh, Paul himself said he was the chiefest of sinners. If he felt he was the chiefest of sinners and Jesus saved him, he saved this desperate man. Don't you think he can save you today? Certainly he can. He can save the most vile of sinners, and he has, and he will even today. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new because of that power over the evil one that can change the vilest sinner. And here's the last one today. This is our thoughts before we leave. Jesus desires us to proclaim his glory and greatness to others. Huh. That's what uh, the desperate man now changed to the delivered man. That's what he did. He was sent, uh, told to go home, go home to his family, go home to his friends. Could you imagine that, that, that renewal day, that day that that man walks in fully dressed? The wife and little kids come to the door, and he says, Honey, I'm home. Look at me. And you could imagine something had to happen at that doorway. 
And the kids would run around and grab dad around the leg. And wife would kiss him up just as she hasn't for many months probably. And now here's that wonderful reunion because of what God did in the life of this man. He says, Jesus saved me. Jesus took all those spirits away from me. Now I'm a new man. I'm not like I used to be. I am now what God's made me. And praise God, I can't wait to tell you. I can't wait to tell my friends. I can't wait to hopefully get my job back with my boss. I can't wait to tell everybody what God has done for me. That would be that reunion of that man. Jesus desires him and desired him to go back and tell everybody. That's the same thing for us. Psalm 66, 16 says, Come and hear, all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Can that be your prayer? Can you tell everybody what God has done for you? Here's a picture as we close here that'll kind of bring it home a bit, all right, to a degree. <laughs> if it means something to you, then say something. If salvation has meant any change in your life, then tell everybody about it. Have you ever seen a lady who just got engaged and she goes back to work? Hi, just, I'm here. Um, I, oh, I'll get you some coffee. Oh, yeah. See, the night before, a dramatic change. He finally said, will you? And she says, yes. And she's got that bling, and she comes and brings it to church, shows everybody, shows the family, shows people at work, everywhere she goes, guess what? I'm getting married. I'm picturing what Chris did. <laughs> it meant something. So she says something. He says something. Can you imagine getting that beautiful rock and going to work and not saying a thing about it? Like it didn't matter. Oh, what's that on your finger? Oh, yeah, I got engaged. What? You got engaged? <gasps> you know, people get excited, but no. I know that's a, a physical picture, but it ought to be all the more so spiritually. I've been changed. God changed my life. I have a future. I have a future home in heaven. I want to tell you what great things Jesus did for me. And what he can do for you. Amen. Well, thank God for the encounter at the cemetery. It was in five different views. As you can see, it's all the same person, but it always involves other people. Do you know any decision you make for the Lord will involve other people? And it's going to affect other people by what you do with Christ. If you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today, it will mean something to you, obviously, but it's going to make an effect on other people about you. If you have make a decision for the Lord in some other fashion, you decide to, to, to give it all in, to, 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 to turn it all in, saying, God, I'm yours totally. It's going to make an effect on your life, but it's going to make an effect on everybody else. What's your decision today? Do you know Jesus? Has he had an encounter with you? We're not in a cemetery. We're in a church house. We're in the best place you can ever make an encounter with the Lord. Let's, let's do it today, all right? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please. Father, I thank you so much for loving us. We thank you for these encounters. Thank you, God, for the story that is very, very true and is very vivid in our minds of the great thing that you have done and had done for this man, this simple, nameless man. Oh, God, I pray that you know us and you do know us. You know our name, you know our heart, you know our destiny. Lord, you know our fears, you know our our thoughts. God, I pray that you would please speak to us today. Lord, if we're not saved, there's someone here not saved, God, draw them, I pray. Lord, help them to know that they can be delivered of their sins. They can have a home in heaven. Oh, Lord, they don't have to be chained anymore. They can truly trust Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and have that victory forever. But God, I know that even as we Christians, we can get caught up into the day-to-day -day life and, and in some ways it can bog or chain us down and we can, might be able to get caught up into some habits some things that are not good for us as a Christian that we're just trying to shed trying to kick oh God in our own powers we can't but we can through you because we know you have that power 
Father, please work with us today. I pray that your, your name will be exalted, your word will be exalted above your name, and Lord, may you be pleased in all that's done. Allow our hearts to commune with you this, this time as we sing this beautiful old song of I'd wandered far from God, now I'm coming home. God, help us to sing from our hearts and move us about it, if you will, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand, please. We'll sing this song, a couple verses together of Lord, I'm coming home. May this be your prayer as well. As the piano plays this next time, I've had every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't often do this, but if you know in the secrecy here of our eyes being closed, maybe except mine, you can say to me, Pastor Mike, I know that I'm saved. I know Jesus is my Savior. And there was a day I came home with my sins, and I, I confessed them before him, and I trusted him as my personal Lord and Savior. There is a date on the calendar. There's a time I know that I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you just ever so slightly just lift up your hand and give me a signal saying, yes, I know there was a day I got saved. You can put your hands down. I appreciate your honesty. Can I tell you that I don't didn't try to notice if anyone here did not raise their hand, but if you did not, or even in your heart, you did not raise your hand, I don't know how often you're going to get that opportunity to trust Christ as our, your Savior. There's no better place, no better time than in a church service where everybody here loves you, I guarantee that. And there's a Jesus who saw you afar off. Jesus saw you coming down the road, coming to church today. He knows maybe the, the, uh, the agony of your heart and the loneliness and the longing of your soul. Today could be your day just to chuck it all in and say, I just need to be saved. I don't have to be chained to this ever, this fear anymore. I can trust you as my Savior. Maybe family members that are here, others that are here, they're saved and they have a peace about them. I don't have a peace about me, but I need that peace. I need to be saved. Is there any here today that would say, Brother Mike, pray for me because I need to be saved today. Is there someone today? Eyes closed. I will not embarrass you, I promise, but I will promise to pray for you. Just slip your hand up ever so little and say, just pray for me, Brother Mike. Uh, again, I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but you can say, pray for me. I'm concerned about my soul. Would you lift your hand up? Is there anyone here today? Father, I pray you'd please help us. Lord, I don't know the hearts of everyone that's here, but you do. Lord, that great power that you had over the sea and over this, this uh, desperate man on the, on the hills of those tombs. God, I, what great power that was. That same power is here today. And God, you can save a desperate soul so easily. So God, please work with our folks here today. Lord, I know it might be troubling and difficult, but I pray that they'd even see me after church or we can get together another time. Lord, our, our heart's desire and a church, the de desire of this church is that people, when they come here, they leave here knowing the truth and knowing that they can know how to be saved. And Lord, if they would just trust you, we'll take that time anytime. 
God, help them. God, move about their heart, we ask in Jesus' name. Let's sing this last verse. Let's sing it together, if you will. appreciate that. Um, my heart's just burdened today of the, the preaching and the, the awesomeness that's about us here today. Not because of this message, because I'm just an old sinner feebly trying to preach a message. But I know that uh, maybe sometimes my humor, my good time with Mike... I just don't want to ever get in the way with the seriousness of the lost. And if you know me, yes, I can have fun and I can joke with the best of us and enjoy eating and all that kind of garb, but my honest desire is, uh, is that you know Jesus as your Savior and that you would leave here knowing the truth of the gospel and that my heart is burdened because there could well be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as your Savior. And that hurts. It hurts a heart. It ought to hurt our hearts. Not because we suspect. You know, not like we're looking and pointing. That's not the thought. But the idea is with a group this size. I mean, Jesus had 12 and one of them was the devil. So you never know. But please, be it known that through my gestures and my fun and all that stuff and obviously much different than Pastor Todd is, that I don't take it very seriously of our spiritual state and that I care deeply for each of you and that I want your relationship with God to be at its best. So pray with us. Pray with one another, if you would, um, regarding all of these things. Anyway, we're going to be dismissed in just a moment, but I want to bring up this real quickly pastor will be here like the next Sunday mornings uh, as well, but he is in the St. Augustine today. He'll be here tonight. We have our Singspiration tonight. If you haven't signed up or put a song that you want to hear sung or you want to volunteer somebody to sing or sing yourself, sign up back there. We're lacking four or five that we want to do, and I just don't want to have to have my kids sing all the other five, all right? <laughs> but nonetheless, um, sign up if you want.